Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From brand new audiobooks such as Alphabet Squadron and the audiobook exclusive Dooku Jedi Lost to our blockbuster movie tie-in editions, you'll have plenty to keep you entertained. Start listening wherever audiobooks are sold. This episode of Coffee with Kenobi is brought to you by MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. For all of your travel needs to Disney theme parks, the cruise lines, or anywhere you want to go on vacation, be sure to go to our affiliate link, which can be found in the show notes, on the front of our webpage, or on our social media, and sign up for a free, no-obligation quote. We are also brought to you by One Nation Coffee, the official brew of Coffee with Kenobi. For the best coffee in the galaxy, go to www com and sign up for a subscription service so you never miss out on the best coffee in the galaxy. This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. This is show number 287, and we are your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I'm here drinking One Nation coffee out of a brand new gold Lucasfilm coffee mug. Thanks to a dear friend that sent this to me. It is a cast member Disneyland exclusive. I am delighted to have it and delighted to share a cup of coffee with each and every one of you on today's show. Jeff McGee of Comics with Kenobi joins me as we return to our list of our top five Kenner Star Wars action figures. On this iteration of the show, we're going to look at the second release of the actual A New Hope figures. These are the 13th through 21st releases, which we will talk about very, very soon. So let's just jump right into it, pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. Joining me today for a cup of coffee is the co-creator of Comics with Kenobi and the pod father of Marvin Dog Media, one of our favorites, returning guests, Jeff McGee. Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm good. Have I ever called you the pod father before? Uh, you have not. That was a phrase that I created for uh, my friend Scott Murray. I call him the pod father of North Texas, so I appreciate oh. it being being transferred over to me, the title being transferred to me. I'll take it. Yes, it is all yours, and, and Scott's not here to say otherwise, so it's definitely going to be right. Good deal. Well, uh, we um, have obviously done a ton of Galaxy's Edge conversation. It's been a blast. We had Corey on last week. This week, we're getting back to some of our continual threads that we've had. Back in February 7th, 2019, you came on, and we started this look at the top five Kenner Star Wars action figures. And instead of just lumping them into movies, I thought it would be more fun to kind of do them in waves like you did. When I came on your show a couple of times for the G.I. Joe stuff, which is still one of my favorite podcasting experiences ever. Um, And you'll be on again. Oh, good. That's good. I I always look at the G.I. Joe when we do the G.I. Joe stuff, because you know more about it than I do and possibly more than Taylor. But we won't let him know that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you are a very kind man. I do love G.I. Joe. But this is our look. As we said, we're returning back to the Kenner line, the original line. The first one, show 164, was the original 12. But this is figures 13 to 21. Could you go ahead and and tell our Coffee with Kenobi family what those figures are? Sure. This is the line affectionately known as the 20 back. And once we got the final figure, the 21 back uh, line, because those are the number of figures on the backs of the card, we had Greedo, Hammerhead, Snaggletooth, Walrus Man, Luke Skywalker, X-Wing Pilot, R5-D4, Death Star Droid, Power Droid, and one bounty hunter named Boba Fett. So this is basically the the creatures and droids line. Yeah. This is basically the Cantina line. Uh, I, I remember, I mean, obviously this is this closes out the A New Hope figures, and the first twelve are iconic naturally. But I can, I think I can say that it, well, I don't even know how I want to explain this, but it sounds like I like the thirteen through twenty one uh, figures releases more, but they just have more 
those specific memories of those particular characters are, are more ensconced in my memory. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, it's like it's like me with the Empire Strikes Back line. That's when I was. Uh, that's the age that I found Star Wars. So the Empire Strikes Back is always sort of my go-to, and those figures. Uh, these I always love these, but but again, the the leap that we that we made in in tooling and and uh, production and technology between even the twelve back to the twenty backs, there, there's a there's a marked difference. We get a lot more color with these. We get. Uh, a little bit more uh, detail with them, and uh, and we just see that grow as as the line grows. So it makes perfect sense that uh, these would be sort of this is your first your first uh, experience with it. So this would always be your favorite. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I remember first James Bond is always your favorite. You know, well, that's true. That's true. Uh, hmm. I don't know. I actually, I think I might like Sean Connery the best because the first one I saw in theaters was Roger Moore. But we can talk about that another same, time. Same for me. Yeah, I think we're, of course, we're the same age. We're both, what, in our early 20s, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah something Times like two. that. <laughs> no, I remember vividly getting the original 12. I remember these. I, I just remember being in different stores. And when I, I would, we would always visit Illinois. I grew up in Louisiana. We would always visit Illinois in the summertime. And I remember going to certain toy stores in Illinois, getting some of these figures, too. So let's jump into it. And obviously, for the if you've never heard Jeff McGee before, I find that really hard to believe because... As I mentioned at the top of the show, Jeff is one of the co-creators of the wonderful Comics with Kenobi with Matt Moore. And that comes out every week on the Coffee with Kenobi Network. But you are, I would say, of your many, many fields of expertise, and you have plenty of them, my friend. I think toys and action figures, there's no one I like listening talk about toys more than you. And these, well, these, these inspired me. Your shows that you did about the Star Wars line, we talked about the G.I. Joe stuff. All of your fun stuff that you do with Taylor, uh, I mean, you're the perfect person to talk about this with. Thank you. I like to think that what I lack in expertise, I make up for with enthusiasm. Indeed, indeed. So I try to live my life. <laughs> I mean, I know as much as the next guy, but I'll enjoy it a lot more. That's right. Well, hey, why don't you start? We and we are going to go in order. I I do have. I mean, we do like to do honorable mentions. I'm sort of juggling what I want to do with that. But give me, don't give me your number one of these. Give me. Let's go five to one. All right, that, that's that's the way I prefer to do it. Uh, my number five is Hammerhead. I love this figure. The only reason that he's this low on my list is his eyes that are darting to the side always kind of creeped me out and made him look a little sketchy, and I found out later that he's actually a good guy, according to the Expanded Universe, which doesn't mm-hmm. apparently count anymore. But uh, I always loved this character. The one thing that always creeped me out about it, though, was I said, where is his mouth when I was a kid, not realizing that the mouth was on the side? And my brother said, well, you see that little fold on his belly there? Yeah, that's where his mouth is. So I spent my entire youth thinking this guy had his mouth covered up by his shirt and was like, you know, drooling all over his shirt all the time. Um, That's the first time I learned my brother can't be trusted. But uh, this figure, this figure is one of the biggest, bigger ones that we got at the beginning of the line. And while, you know, the, the blue onesie that he's wearing is not exactly screen accurate, the sculpt on his head and they even they even sculpted in like the veins on his neck. It's pretty stinking screen accurate from what we saw in the film. And he's always been one of my favorites. I, I wish you didn't say blue onesie. I don't know how I'm ever going to unsee that for the rest of my life. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> well, he's going to come up again later. He's uh, the Athorian now in Galaxy's Edge. Doc Ondor is an Athorian. But we didn't know that at the time. We just knew it was Hammerhead. And he's definitely a standout. I mean, I'm well, we're going to talk about him later. My number five, I had a hard time with with my number five because it's sort of tied with what I'm thinking of for an honorable mention, but I'll just stick with what I originally put down, and my number five is Greedo. Nice, uh, good choice. Yeah, Greedo's a great choice. I'll say this, Greedo is also my number four, so we can just have a discussion about him now. Spoilers. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, as with all of these, the, the sculpt, the look, the design of this character is glorious. I like the figure more than I like Greedo in the film. Right. And I just like the, the bodysuit, just the look, the way the hands can grip the blaster, which is the authentic looking blaster, at least in you know, in your kids' memory in your when you're a child, your memory of that. Right. And it's it's just a very unique figure. I, I whenever I see Greedo, I always think of the Cantina playset and I always think of the box that shows Greedo and Han facing one another. And this was one of the first times where you could have a face off between Two on-screen enemies. Of course, you could use 
Obi Wan and Darth Vader, but that's it's just not really the same. That's much more epic and grandiose. This is more like in the street kind of stuff between Han Solo and Greedo. You can set it up with the play set. It just was a a very very fun, a very very fun figure, and I've I've always kind of liked him. Same here. He's an interesting figure because from the neck down, he's not extremely screen accurate because you know in the film he wasn't wearing a a neon green bodysuit like you said. Uh, he was wearing, you know, a, a, a brown vest and like blue pants with pleats on them. But from the neck up, this sculpt is pretty, again, pretty stinking screen accurate. They got the uh, the mohawk that he's got, his eyes and his his mouth, the, the the lips, the way they made his lips and his even his ears. It's just it's it's the word I always used to describe it is charming. When I think of an alien or a creature, yeah. this Greedo figure is the one that I always think of. It's hard to look at and, the Greedo figure and think of it as a bad guy. It really is because he's just so goofy looking. But then you remember, oh, yeah, he did pull a gun on Han Solo. Yes. But, uh, but but yeah, I actually do love the fact that he is in that neon green because what it, what I like doing, what I used to do as a kid, is I would put him in my water moccasin with G.I. Joe because it's he's color coordinated with it. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> he kind of looks like a match, swamp. Boot, match the, match, he has boots match the color scheme of the uh, of the water moccasin from uh, cobra so i uh, yeah but you're right, you're exactly right i love this figure and everything about it and it was a lot of fun to be able to set him up with han and the the creature cantina and and have them battle it out around the table yes it's always a lot of fun around the jajaric table of course the boots with the fur oh, that's something else i love that and so that's your number four that's my number four so yes. your number four so my number four is power droid the you're Gronk not gonna believe droid. this it is power droid is my number no it's my number three is it really? It is. So, oh, yeah, wow. this, we didn't plan this. It's going to be a quick this show. It worked out. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I, I can talk about Power Droid for, for a long, long, long time. Uh, so, so, but, yo, know, go ahead. Yeah, well, Power Droid for me, these, these like I said, I mean, I could, any of these could easily be number one in our list because this is just a, this is a great, this is a great wave of figures. This is maybe one of the top waves of figures ever, ever done in any line, really. I'm sure you probably agree with that. Absolutely. They power droid. It's cute. It's little. It's only on screen in a new hope for a split, you know, second or two. Uh, it's got the, if you're lucky enough, your original one still, when you move the legs, it still does that wonderful little they clicking click. noise. Yeah. Yep. Mine does. Of course. Um, of course it does. It's just, it's just a great little design. There's nothing like it in the entire line of star Wars Kenner action figures. Uh, I mean, there's no other figure or characters like it on screen. So that's part of it, but just, the fact that Kenner continued to not be lazy. I mean, look, I love the He-Man Masters of the Universe line, but a lot of them are re- repurposed and repainted to be yeah, reused, reused parts all over the place. Yeah, but in when this, this is not the case at all. And there have been a number of reiterations of Power Droids or Gonk Droids, if you want, but nothing matches the charm and the personality and the uniqueness of the Power Droid. Not at all. And the the power droid, he like I said, he's number three on my list, which may seem a little high for a figure that is really just a box with legs. But I've always been drawn to this figure, even as a kid, because it's pretty easy to make this guy screen accurate because there's the you know, the, the 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 actual droid that they used on screen was basically looked like just two tubs turned upside down, uh, you know, set end to end or top to bottom, top to top rather with legs. It was very easy to do, but the thing that I loved about this was, yes, it's a very simple figure. It's a box with two legs, but this is an example of what Kenner did. Kenner basically strove to give you the same value in every figure so that if you had a figure that was bigger, it might not be as detailed, but if you have a figure that was smaller, they're going to throw on, like with the Jawa, they're going to throw on a soft goods cloak. They're going to throw in some detail even under the cloak. With Power Droid, he's got limited articulation, all he's really got, they gave you the uh, they gave you the uh, the sticker for his faceplate, but it's a great sticker. They gave you the little rubbery antenna on top that was a little movable. You could kind of kind of manipulate it a little bit, and like you said, his legs clicked. He's the only figure that they did that with, and I think that is because they thought, you know, this is a smaller figure. He doesn't do much. We've got to give the kids a little more play value. Here's what we'll do. This is something, it, it makes perfect sense. That's what this droid would do. We can't make him make the noise, the gonk, gonk noise that he made in the film, but we're going to make him make some kind of noise. And I love the fact that on his legs, they basically had them ribbed up and down. Like they're, they're, they're coils on them rather than just being smooth. 
And the thing that always amazed me the most about this figure was, uh, you know, mine is uh, probably as old as yours and has been played with as much as yours. Those legs never got loose. No. I don't know how they did that, but the legs never got loose. And the other reason that he's so high on my list, though, has very little to do with the figure. It's because of the card art, the backing art behind him. Oh, sure. That is one of the prettiest, and I can say pretty, is one of the prettiest backing cards that we got from the entire line. The pink and blue hue with him just standing there, it's just striking. It's one of my favorites of the Gentle Giant Jumbos because that, that image is so striking to me i just i i love having him up on my walls so i can look at it. it's it's very soothing to me no i and that's I something and that. that's something that's something that i really uh really respond to is when i can look at something and, and feel a sense of relief and a sense of relaxation that's saying something because i'm, I'm not somebody who relaxes easily uh, so everything about this figure was just perfect and i love the way they did it and shout out to matt moore who uh you know, Gonk, if you love Star Wars, was the first thing that I I, I sent him back. I sent him back one from uh, Celebration Anaheim because he just had to have one, and I got one for Taylor as well. All uh, all of my friends, I'm always amazed at how many people love the Gonk droid. I still, um, gosh, so many things I want to ask about based on what you just said. Did you open the Gentle Giant um, one and to, to mess with the legs and stuff? Mm-hmm. I have not yet, partially because Taylor threatened to do that, to open it and play with it and steal it. So I've, I've had to keep it under lock and key whenever he was around. And um, it's one that I probably will eventually. I just haven't yet because it is such a large figure. I was afraid once I got it out, I wouldn't want to put it back. And no, then I, I have to buy another one to display with the rest of my figures because that's how it works when you're me. I know. But I haven't yet. But as far as I know, um, as far as I know, that the, the the legs do click on it. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that they do too. I mean, that, those things are all from the original molds. Uh, I mean, not really. I mean, it's not the same size, but it's the same. I'm not even sure of how that what went into making that. Is there any documentary on that? That'd be fun to see. Yeah, I don't know. They just, as far as I know, they just scanned it and just blew it up like they did. You know, when they shrunk the originals, I think they just did the exact uh, exact opposite. Mm. Oh, yeah. This, I forgot about the shrinking, the incredible shrinking figure. Very good. So yeah. that was your number three, right? Yes. Okay. So that means that I'm up to my number three, and then we'll take a break. My number three is Hammerhead. And again, that has nothing to do with having a particular affinity for the characters on screen for, you know, a nanosecond. And and I never, like these, all the Cantina figures from the Kenner line. I'd never cared at all that they didn't look necessarily like they do in the film, just because there's so much charm and personality and memory attached to these things. I love the incredibly unique shape of Hammerhead's head. The fact that it's, it just seems so illogical and, you know, implausible, but it works. It really, really works. Just the, even like the arms and the legs and the feet, those wonderful three pegged, aren't they three toed feet? I've got mine. Yes. I've got my original ones on display in front of me, but the hammerhead ones up high, so I can't really jump up and see while I'm recording. And they're just it's just and he has that stormtrooper blaster too, doesn't he? Uh yes, he does. So I thought he does, which is why I always thought he was a bad guy. Yeah, same here. Same here. But apparently he's not, which you know, when they made these, I'm sure that wasn't necessarily on their mind. They just wanted to get some more figures out there for people to buy and buy them we did. But Hammerhead has always had a lot of uniqueness and personality and charm as well. I mean, from a, for a different reason than Power Droid, but great stuff. Just great stuff. So let's go ahead. Uh, that's three. We've gone through three already. And we've still got our top two and probably an honorable mention that we've thrown in here or there. I just realized when we do these, I don't throw in any vehicles. I know when we do G.I. Joe, we always have the vehicles in there, too. But I guess we do that for another time. What do you say? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's another show. It's another show, which anytime I can talk with you is a good thing. So let's take a break. And when we come back, Jeff and I will finish out our list of the top five from the second wave of Star Wars Kenner line. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Greetings. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio, featuring sound effects, top-notch narrators, and music directly from the movies. Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From Luke Skywalker to Kylo Ren 
To Admiral Akbar, you'll recognize all of your favorite characters. Listen to movie tie-ins like The Last Jedi and The Force Awakens, and original titles such as Alphabet Squadron, Master and Apprentice, and the audiobook exclusive Dooku Jedi Lost. With Star Wars audiobooks, you'll have plenty of Star Wars listening to keep you entertained. Available wherever audiobooks are sold. MEI and Mouse Fan Travel is the place that I went to very first thing when I heard the news about Star Wars Rise of the Resistance opening at Walt Disney World and Disneyland in December and January, respectively. So they are the place I'm going to go. I recommend that you do the same. They have signature service and expert advice to help clients maximize their vacation time and dollar. And best of all, they have a no-cost, no-obligation quote when you use the service, and they also proactively adjust the booking if the rate goes down. They will help your family enjoy everything the Disney theme parks and the cruise lines have to offer, will plan every detail, and can share invaluable tips. Be sure to go to our affiliate link, which can be found in the show notes on the front of our webpage or on social media, and sign up for a free, no-obligation quote. Recently on Coffee with Kenobi, we made a big announcement that we are going to do something different with our CWK Patreon page, something that actually makes a difference in the world and not just in the studios of Coffee with Kenobi, although we certainly appreciate that as well. But before I explain that a little bit more, I want to thank Jason Hall, Rebecca Raven, Dennis Keithley, Colby Mead, Yancey Evans, Dave Ritchie, Ross Halibin, Frank Mulder, Alexander Moylan, Melinda Wolf, Aaron Harris, Chris Gavarka, Angela Sauce, Mediocre Jedi, Christine Turk, Sean Reed, Kurt McKellen, Dan Ream, Brian Harding, Blake Weaver, Jim Capron, Caroline Maselli, Chris Metz, LJ Souter, Thea Selby, Jeff Ellis, Daz Davies, Christian Dale, Brian McKinney, Connie Shee, Jared Cantor, BJ Smith, Eric Struthers, Nick Deco, and Mark Souter. These Coffee with Kenobi Patreon contributors have helped to do so much for our show. They help keep the lights running in the Coffee with Kenobi studio, help add to our travel, and help us create and do a lot of things with this show, both past, present, and future, that we could not do without you. And you get something out of it as well. You get access to CWK Porver, which is our weekly show. For $5 a month, we hear myself, Tom Gross, and Corey Club talking about Star Wars, behind the scenes of this show, and all kinds of popular culture. We just released last week the Spider-Man Far From Home spoiler-filled review show, so that was fun to kind of flex our muscles non-Star Wars related, but there's plenty of Star Wars content, that is for sure. But most importantly, and the thing that is the most important to me and close to my heart, is that 10% of your donation to Patreon every month goes to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to help take care of children who have so much that they have to struggle with that they shouldn't have to, but they do. So we hope this will help in some way help out them and their family. So thank you so much to you for your donations. Not only do you help Coffee with Kenobi, but more importantly, 10% of everything you donate goes to the St. Jude Children's Hospital every single month. If you have any questions, be sure to go to www.patreon.com slash coffee with Kenobi or let me know and I'll be happy to let you know about what we have going on and how your contributions will help better the world for these wonderful children. Thank you so much. We're back, and we've got two left on our list. So, so far, remind the good people what your five, four, and three were. Absolutely. My five, four, and three were, in this order, Hammerhead, Greedo, and Power Droid, and we had a lot of overlap on our lists. That's so funny. (laughs) Mine was Greedo, Power Droid, and Hammerhead. Yeah, funny so how there, that works. It is you're, funny you're, how that works. You're a man of, you're a man of impeccable taste, obviously. <laughs> well, likewise. Okay, I have a feeling uh, this is going to continue, but let's just see. What is your number two? My number two is the X-Wing Luke, or mm-hmm. Luke Skywalker, X-Wing fighter pilot, whatever however they call it. I love this figure. I love everything about it. I love the card back. We talk, I talk about it on Talking Toys with Taylor and Jeff, which you can find on MarvinDownMedia.com all the time, that I'm I'm just really drawn to color. I talk about it on Comics with Kenobi all the time, that I'm really drawn to the colors of a, of a particular panel. This one, everything worked. Orange and blue is one of my favorite color combinations, and they chose a bright blue field for the backing uh, the, behind the bubble and for the, the backing on his, uh, his nameplate. 
And then we've got this great image of Luke crawling up into his X-Wing holding his helmet. So you get that, that orange suit in the photo and the orange on his flight suit on the figure against this blue. It's just very striking and works so well. And this was the first time that we really started to see the leaps and bounds they were making with sculpting and the technology because we've got the, the sculpt on the flight suit and the helmet. They've even, they even went through and, and sculpted the, uh, the, the blast shield that he would, that he would pop down. You can see the, the, uh, the bottom edges of the goggles or the eye covers, I guess, there. Uh, and then, um, uh, on the, on the flight suit itself, on the, uh, what I'm going to call the tank top that he wears over the white tank top. It's ribbed and you can see the, uh, the, the equipment that he's got on there, the uh, life support systems and things like that that are on there are just wonderful. And they even went through to sculpt the, uh, the uh, things that go, the, the things that go around his legs, the black that goes around his legs. Yeah. It's just really a phenomenal figure. And the other thing I love about this one, it was weird and I don't necessarily, I'm glad they didn't continue this, but it was weird. His, I believe it's his right hand is, is in a perfect circle so that you can fit his gun in there very easily. Yeah. It's weird. They did that. This is the only figure they did that with as far as I know, but, uh, he's, he's the only Luke that didn't come with a lightsaber. Oh, that's true. Because in yeah. the, in the movie, he didn't have his lightsaber for this part. Right. He didn't even show it. And t- not until the Empire Strikes Back when he's wearing his flight suit. And you can see it then as on sort of his hold, not as on his belt, not his holster, but his belt. Right. Huh. Interesting. I'm going to talk about that figure later, too. It's a good one. Wow. It's definitely a good one. It is a good one. Okay. So my number two is Walrus Man. Walrus Man is. Did you pick Walrus Man as number two because you knew he would be number my number one? No, but I I knew before I even texted you that that would be your number one. And then we're going to talk about that, I'm sure. In fact, we have on a previous show, but it's it's a great story worth repeating. But I've always liked this character. I've just been so fascinated by him. He really has hardly anything to do with the on-screen counterpart, even even less than the others. But, I mean, look at that color. You've got green hands, orange, like a bodysuit, I guess, or like at least a torso, blue arms and legs. That wonderful, unusual green head with that mouth. Uh, just a, an incredible figure. Again, you could do something with the Cantina playset where he could attack Luke and Obi-Wan could come in and save the day. I've just always loved, loved the look, the color, the, everything about that figure. I like how it feels in your hand, too, which sounds funny because they're all the same material. But I just have always loved it. And then a couple of Christmases ago, one of my very favorite people sent me uh, a walrus man uh, with a note written. And I and it was just a wonderful thing. I carry it with me all the time. It's in my car or in my backpack all the time. And that person was you. So I'm hoping you will tell the story about that because that's always meant so much to me. Now, now that that figure always reminds me of you, not because you look alike. Although we do, we have the same hairline. Yeah. Um <laughs> Oh, you're you're absolutely right. This figure is probably the least screen accurate figure of this entire line uh, that we got, but it doesn't matter. I just got through saying that, you know, orange and blue are one of my favorite color combos and check. He's got both of those here. And the, the other thing that I love about this figure, something I noticed several years ago, is if you look at his eyes and the way his head is shaped, he kind of looks like Sugar Bear, the sugar, the super golden crisp mascot. Oh, kind of. Yeah. And, you know, I was a fat kid, so anything that reminds me of sugary cereal is always uh, welcome. But so the story behind Walrus Man, and if, if you've heard the story before, uh, this won't be the last time you'll hear it. Uh, just be prepared. Um, <clears throat> 1986 or so, I was going through my collection of action figures, and I realized I had every single Star Wars action figure with the exception of four. I was missing, uh, I was missing Snaggletooth, Death Star Droid, Walrus Man, and Yak Face. And I was trying to figure out how I'd missed Yak Face because it was Power of the Force. I was right in the prime of my collecting. And I mentioned it to my mom just in passing. And my mom took it upon herself. This is pre-internet. Took it upon herself to find the phone number for Kenner Products in Cincinnati, Ohio, and call them and say, hey, my kid needs these four figures. Do you have any left? In, do you have any stock left that you can send us? And the lady at the time told her, well, we never made Yak Face, which was a lie. They just didn't sell it in North America. But it's okay. I'll, I'll let it slide. She said, but we do have the other three. We can send them to you. It'll be, you know, four bucks, four bucks a piece shipping. My mom said sold. Send them to us. Didn't know this was going to happen. This package showed up. My mom said, hey, open this up. Open it up. And there are these three figures. 
in there. And then she Best said, yeah, ever. I tried to, get, tried to get the fourth one, but she said they didn't ever, they didn't actually make it. I said, oh, okay, well, th- this was amazing. And so this was something that's always stuck with me because this was just one example of my mom, not only being the great enabler, which is what I refer to her as, but uh, also an example of her doing everything within her power to help her kids and those that she cares about reach their goals and complete their projects and, and, and finish what they started. And it's always something that stuck with me. And to this day, uh, that's something that sticks with me. My, my best friend, Taylor, who is my talking toys with Taylor and Jeff co-host had a, had a child and they made me the Godfather. And at his baby shower, I gave him a walrus man, uh, for that express reason. I said, I just want him to remember that as long as I'm around, he's got somebody around who will help him reach his goals. It's, it's a wonderful symbol. It's a wonderful and symbol. It is. And, and so then I, I sent one to you, one to Corey, and one to Matt. Uh, and I always carry a walrus man around with me. It's not the original. The original I still keep because I don't want it to get any more messed up than it already is. But I keep a walrus man with me at all times in my, my messenger bag that I carry with me, just kind of as a reminder of my mother and as a reminder that I did always have somebody in my corner. And uh, thankfully, I still do have lots of somebody's in my corner. But uh, it's it's always nice to just have that memory. And uh, the figure itself, like, everything you said about it is absolutely true. I love everything about this figure, even though it's not screen accurate. It's just so much fun. This, When I think about Star Wars action figures, that's the image that pops into my head. And for that reason, plus just sheer nostalgia, he is and will always be my number one choice for this portion of the uh, of the toy line. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm going to guess, and I don't want to ruin a future show, but I'm going to guess... He's he's second only to Bespin Han Solo in this entire line. Uh, pro- yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, you know what? It's probably a two uh, a two way tie between he and the Emperor's Royal Guard for number two. Oh, really? Oh, cool. I love that. I love that figure so much. Oh, that's a great figure. We'll we'll definitely get to those at some point. Huh? Wow. Okay, so that's your number one. A great choice. Obviously, it was my number two. Uh, my number one. Is what do you think I'm going to say? I'm guessing it's going to be either X Wing Luke or Boba Fett. It's Boba Fett. Of course it is. Now, I want to be really clear on this, and longtime listeners of the show probably already can guess what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Boba Fett is not my favorite Star Wars character. He's probably not even in my top 20. I mean, I'd, I really don't have any, I really don't, I could care less about Boba Fett. And I don't mean that as a pejorative. It's more like, I love him in Empire. I he, did, he didn't really do much in Return of the Jedi for me, and then I've never really grasped onto the expanded universe stuff with Boba Fett. Uh, in Attack of the Clones, I like Daniel Logan as a person and as a performer, but it wasn't my favorite portrayal of the character. He just he was an, an incredible looking figure or character, and mostly because of this figure. I'm gonna say that this Boba Fett action figure it might be my favorite action figure of any action figure period so it is a very defensible position it yeah is a great figure I, i'm with you he's not he's not my uh, my favorite character at all uh, i'm not bosk is my favorite of the bounty hunters mm-hmm. uh which we'll talk about when we talk about uh, a, a different wave yeah. but i i'm with you 100 it that that figure is phenomenal everything about him again i've always said i'm, I'm big on color any color you like you're gonna find it on that figure yeah it's great. It's great. My it, it was the it was the mail the first mail away. Well, I guess it's not the first mail away. Technically, it was the uh, you know the early bird set, right? Uh, but but of Luke, Leia, R two, and and Chewie, right? That was the yeah. Um. Yeah. So, but this was the first one that was solo a solo one. Interesting choice of words. And I remember getting him. I remember getting all the the little pieces and mailing away. And there's nothing, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, there's nothing like being a kid and getting a bunch of little box tops or little um, things you cut off the back of your action figure cards and mailing them away and getting an action figure in the mail in like 8 to 12 weeks. It's the best because there's no internet. You can't track the package back when you know this came out. So when we finally got Boba Fett, I had him. And I I brought him with me to school, which I almost never did because I was so worried about losing figures or losing their weapons. And I opened up the school bus window and I held Boba Fett out the window, put his hands up and he was flying. You know, in my mind, he was flying as the as the school bus was driving. And I was moving him up and down with my hands. And I remember a split second thinking, well, what if I drop him? No, I won't drop him. And I didn't. I didn't drop him. 
looking back now, a couple things crossed my mind. One, why did the school bus driver let me put my hands out the window? Shouldn't it was have done the that. 80. It was the eighties. Yeah. School bus drivers. I didn't even have a seat. I had to stand for the entirety of my bus ride when I was a kid. Are you serious? Yep. Oh. Oh, I said, are you serious? And my phone jumped up and thought it was very <laughs> interesting. It said, I'm not allowed to be frivolous. Okay, well, thank you for that. Anyway, so I didn't drop it. And I, and this was before we even saw the Empire Strikes Back because I got the figure before Empire yeah, he came was, out. He was the preview figure, yeah. Yeah, and it was just it was just the greatest thing, the coolest looking figure. Of course, there's all the, the urban myths about the rocket fire backpack, which listen to our Steve Sansweet's first appearance on the show. to we'll talk more about that. But it's just, I mean, it's the coolest thing ever. He's now, I did a, a poll on Twitter, I don't know, probably six months ago, where I said, who is cooler, Boba Fett or Snake Eyes? And, of course, I voted for Snake Eyes because Snake Eyes is way cooler. But when it comes to action figures, Boba Fett is it, man. That is that is my number one. Uh, again, very defensible choice. Um I, I cannot cannot fault you at all. It, uh, and, and, again, he's, he's, he's kind of everybody's favorite. Uh, yeah. The first mail away figure that I got was, I believe, for for LOM or for LOM, as I called him. Uh, mm-hmm. Another story after my mother passed away in 2008 and we were going through her house, cleaning everything up. And we used to I used to when I would every time I would get a figure, I would cut out the proofs of purchase on them. Even yeah. if I wasn't actively saving them for something specific, I always cut them. My mom always said, cut them out just in case, you know, something does come along that you want. And we would keep them in this little uh, this little ring container uh, up in the uh, cabinet where we kept the dishes. And after she passed away, I'm cleaning, I'm cleaning out the house and I go to put, pick this thing up and I find like four or five of those proofs of purchase oh. round proofs of purchase. They were green because they were from Jedi and power of the force. Yep. But I found those that were still there from what? 30 years before. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. That's great. That is great. I, I thought for sure both would show up in your top five. No, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan. You know, like I said, I, I, I understand why everybody likes him. But uh, I I think I have a little bit of Boba Fett backlash because I he doesn't do much in the films and I just was never that drawn to him. I didn't realize he was cool until I started going to conventions in the late 90s. I didn't well, realize that Boba Fett was cool and I didn't realize that the Ewoks sucked until the late 90s. Well, there was a great poster of Boba Fett that came out during the Empire Strikes Back that I had. And I found it in my in my grandma's basement years ago. So I laminated it, and it's hanging up in my classroom. In fact, it was the image on the very first article I ever wrote for StarWars.com where I talked about mythology and Star Wars and how I use it in the classroom. And so just that poster and that figure, like I said, before I even saw the movie, I've, I've always liked that Boba Fett idea so much. But the more that has come out, the less it's like, eh, okay. But I love him in Cloud City so much. He looks great photographed next to Vader on Bespin. And that's really all it is for me. Other than that, then in Jedi, it didn't really do much for me, especially when they put him in for the special edition. And he's like, like kind of casually flirting with some of Jabba's dancers. I'm like, oh, come on. That, I don't need that. That's no good. That's not, that's not for me. But hey, <laughs> some people like that and that's fine. You know, more power to him. God bless him. But yeah, he is my number one. Do you have any honorable mentions you want to talk about? Well, I have uh, obviously Snaggletooth uh, is an honorable mention because of uh, and the uh, and the Death Star droid because of you know they, they were in in with the package that Walrus Man came in, but uh, the the one that I had that was really probably a, a true honorable mention would have been R five D four because he's just the droid that never gets any love, mm-hmm. and uh, and I I've always been fond of the figure because just mainly because it, it's a different color scheme than R two D two. The red to R2-D2 is blue, and I liked his dome. The yeah. dome that looked like an upside-down salad bowl. <laughs> Again, the fat kid, everything went back to food. But I've always just, I always just liked this figure because he, he, he's, you know, he's got those three eyes on the front and everything. And uh, he was the one that all we really got was a new head with this one. Uh, but I always liked that, and I liked the fact that they gave him a, a vac metal a little ring around un, under his head. So R5-D4 was, was my true honorable mention. He was one that I, I kind of struggled putting him on the list versus uh, Hammerhead, but ultimately I went with Hammerhead because we just there's more to him. I I thought about putting Snail to them, my honorable mention. I didn't, and only because of the the character that I have standing next to him. That would be Luke and his X-wing thing. And when I first was making my list, Luke was right there, but I just sort of it, my eyes just sort of passed over him, and I went down to R five D four, and it and it wasn't because I don't like him. I just 
don't know. I just sort of camouflaged in and I, I zeroed back in. I'm like, wait a minute. Don't you remember how cool Luke was? How cool it was that there was an actual different outfit of Luke Skywalker and he was in his X-Wing pilot costume and you could put him in the actual X-Wing and fly him around. But you know what kind of stopped me from putting him in my actual top five was that the fact that he looks nothing like Mark Hamill. I mean, none of them really do, but even you can't even tell he has blonde hair. And I guess you yeah, can't really. That's a good point. That's a good thing. point. Yeah. That always stopped me. But I, but I love him. I mean, I, he's he's definitely my honorable mention. I've, I've always thought he was super cool, but the fact that he that they didn't even try to make him look like Mark Hamill, it always kind of stopped me. Well, you know, the uh, we didn't really get a, a good Mark Hamill likeness until uh, no. until uh, I, I think Hoth, well, Hoth Luke is okay, but but Jedi Luke is probably the closest that we got. Yeah, um, no Hoth for, Luke. For Hoth Luke. I, hold on, I have to genuflect. I love Hoth Luke, but I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a great figure. It is but no, I didn't even I didn't even think about that because I just and I think that may have been by design because. If you wanted to troop build, you could buy several of those, and the the face was generic enough that it could have been Luke, it could have been Wedge, it could have been well, you could have painted a mustache on to make it Bigs, but we didn't even exactly. see Bigs in the movie. so it really it could have been Luke or Wedge. Those are the only two that we really knew by name at that point, um, and so maybe maybe that's why they did it. Uh, anything else you want to say about these before we wrap up this week's show? No, other than other than I you know thanks for having me on. I enjoy yeah. you know, being able to deep dive on on a very small subset of the line. Uh, and I'm I'm excited because next time again the the sculpting and the technology is just going to get better as as these waves go on. So I'm I'm just very excited at uh, at the, the prospect of getting to discuss these again uh, in another six months or so. Are there three lines in the Empire wave or three waves in the Empire? There are in Empire. We had the 31 back. Then we had the well 31, 32 back. We had the 41 back. And then we have the 45 back. So, yes, there are three. Well, there was actually there was a 45, 47 and 48. But I but for all intents and purposes, yes, there were three. That's what I thought. OK, yeah, that's, we'll get to that at some point. But there are many other things to talk about, like all the cool stuff that you have coming out on the airways, including a brand new show. Yes, I'm very excited. Marvin Dog Media just a couple of weeks ago, uh, J- July 2nd to be exact, we premiered the first episode of the Saturday Morning Supercast. And the Saturday Morning Supercast is a celebration of Saturday mornings when we were kids. It talks about the two things that I most associate with Saturday mornings, uh, cartoons and breakfast cereal. This is a show that I've been kind of mulling around in my head for several years now, and I finally just got everything together and uh, have decided to just launch it. Uh, the first episode featured myself and my co-host, Corey, and our special guest, Matt Moore, of Comics with Kenobi fame. And we discussed uh, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And the cereal that we discussed, we actually, it was a twofer. We discussed a cereal called Havsies, which was apparently disgusting. Matt had had, had a bowl of it when he was a kid. Uh, and since we didn't have a whole lot to talk about with Havsies, we also talked about uh, Frosted Flakes, since that was my favorite cereal as a kid and it's still my favorite cereal <laughs> as an adult. Um, we did that. But the the uh, show that uh, just came out this past week, on this past Tuesday, uh, we had a very, very special guest, a very uh, lovely and talented uh, co- uh, guest host named Dan Zare, who uh, I I think you know him. Oh, yeah. I, he's he's a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's quite a looker, too. Uh, <laughs> and we, we had a lot of fun with you. Corey and I had a lot of fun with you discussing uh, the Pac-Man cartoon as well as Pac-Man cereal as well as yes. Kicks. And That's what I've right. tried to do on the show is if, if there's a cereal that, that we're discussing that there's not a whole lot to it, we kind of pair it with a cereal that this, the, the first cereal is kind of based on. Because Pac-Man cereal obviously was a tie-in, and it was sort of loosely based on kicks. And so we, we, we had a lot of fun talking about that and talking about just the, the general uh, weirdness of the Pac-Man cartoon. And the reason it's called the Saturday Morning Supercast is because in the mid-'80s, there was a cartoon called the Saturday Supercade, which was based on video games. Okay. They, they use you had Donkey Kong, Pitfall, Cubert, and I believe Frogger and Kangaroo. Yeah, that's all, right. That's you know, right. That yeah. And yeah. so I, I kind of named the show after that. And so that that's available on Marvin Dog Media. You can also find Talking Toys with Taylor and Jeff there. Uh, that show comes out uh, every week, uh, with the exception of one week a month we take the week off. But uh, we, we usually do three shows a month, sometimes four. And uh, then on Comics with Kenobi, Matt and I uh, this week are discussing uh, Star Wars issue number 68, the uh, new story arc and a new creative team, which we had a lot of fun with, and the Age of Resistance uh, one-shot about Captain Phasma. And that's that's on uh, 
comic comics with Kenobi, which is on the coffee with Kenobi network. That's right. And, uh, I know a lot of people listening now have told me and have, have shared this information on social media that the main reason they like Star Wars comics is because of hearing you guys talk about it. So Marvel owes you a check. I agree. I absolutely yeah. agree. For sure. Well, hey, Jeff, always, always a great pleasure to have you on the show. I love talking with you just, you know, professionally and just, you know, as your friend. It is, there's there's so much life is busy. You know, we have our family, we have our careers, we have lots of things we want to do. We like to take naps sometimes. So it's hard sometimes to fit in time with your friends. I'm always glad when I get to speak with you. You know, part of the reason that I do podcasts as often as I do is because it forces me to schedule time to talk to my friends. And at the end of that conversation, I just happen to have a product that I can release and unleash upon an unsuspecting public. That's right. Well, on the off chance that they are suspecting, and I think that they are, you've told us (laughs) where we can find your stuff, but where can people find you personally if they want to ask you any questions or just say hello? Well, I'm on Twitter. You can find me. I have two accounts. I have one for Marvin Dog Media that's at Marvin Dog Media. And my uh, individual account, my personal account, I guess, is at the Jeff McGee. Uh, so you can find me at either one of those. And uh, if you do, just make sure you tweet at me because I, I, I'm still learning how to use Twitter. I've been on there for about 10 years and I still have trouble with it. So uh, just make sure you tweet at me or DM me and I'll, I'll, I should see it. And I think I can figure out how to reply. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> Before we close out the show, I want to thank our guests for today. That would be Jeff McGee, of course, from Comics with Kenobi and Marvin Dog Media. I'd also like to thank our CWK sponsors. Penguin Random House Audio, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, and One Nation Coffee. Please support them the way they support our podcast, and remember to listen to new and archived shows of Coffee with Kenobi wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, YouTube, where you can find the audio as well as some occasional videos, and our website, www.coffeewithkenobi.com, or wherever you enjoy listening to your favorite shows. And if you listen to the show through iTunes, please leave us a review. You can also find us on social media apps such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest, and we would love for you to check us out on each of those places. Be sure to listen to our CWK family of shows too, including Legends Library, Resistance Reactions, Comics with Kenobi, and Lattes with Leia. Please leave a review for each of their shows as well, and be sure to subscribe to each of them individually on their own respective feeds. In addition to the places I just mentioned for Coffee with Kenobi, you can find me twice a month on the podcast Looking at Lucasfilm, part of the Jim Hill Media Podcast Network, as well as on Twitter at Mr. Zer, M-R-Z-E-H-R. And you can find my writing on CWK's website, as well as stars.com, where I'm an official blogger there, as well as on IGN, where I can... As well as IGN, where I contribute articles on Star Wars, as well as other topics of popular culture interests. Don't forget to check out www.patreon.com slash coffee with Kenobi to help support the show. And remember that you get access to CWK Pourover, our exclusive podcast, to CWK Lens, which is behind the scenes video and images. But most importantly, 10% of your donations go to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to help out children and their families. You can also get t-shirts, coffee mugs, and so much more through our Patreon page. Thank you as always for joining me each and every week for a cup of coffee I really can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about and break down the Star Wars saga with me. It truly is the best mythology and fandom, and I can't think of better people to discuss it with than each and every one of you. Until next time, may the Force be with you, and have a great weekend. This is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along.